Welcome into another edition of the KSO Show. I'm Mason Voth, joined by Derek Young. Uh, this this Monday edition, it'll be like we're running the hurry up offense. We won't try to be here as long for everybody, but uh, there are enough things we still, you know, can can tie the bow on for week one and also start to look ahead for week two against Troy for the Wildcats as uh, K State tries to to get through this second non conference game, set themselves up for the first road trip of the season. A lot of other things that come with getting ready to start play against the Power Five opponent. But the first one up is going to be a group of five school in Troy. But before we dive into to all of that, let's uh, take a look back. Last week, we had our over unders that, that ran. Uh, Drew put all these together for us. We went through, we all gave our opinions on them. And uh, this, is, this is a way to keep ourselves honest, you know, make sure we can track uh, how everybody did and, and at least, you know, expose ourselves when we're wrong and also be able to give out some pats on the back when we're right. The very first one where we were, you know, it's like if you were tracking and, and it was like, hey, you've got this. It's like the win percentage on ESPN. Our win percentage on Ben Senate over five and a half catches was at like 99.9% at one point in the second quarter. And then the game kept progressing. And it's like, oh, okay, it's only at 85% now, but he'll probably get there. Will Howard loves throwing him the ball. And uh, it bottomed out. We, we got a tweet mid-game from Scott Wildcat, who apologized for uh, doubting Ben Sennett. And he probably, knowing him, that was probably his thoughts on the situation. And Ben Sennett only ends up with five catches. Very productive five catches at 100 yards, though. Uh, ben Sennett was very good in the game. Just K-State was too dominant to get him a sixth catch, I guess. Yeah, and if you would have told me that Keegan Johnson wasn't going to play beforehand, I probably would have even said it was a slam dunk to go over five and a half catches, even though it's a it's a high number for Kansas State tight ends. But, yeah, that that was an unfortunate one. Whew. <laughs> yeah, that one, uh, that's tough to, to look back on and, and see how it ends up working out. Uh, the next one, we all took the over and it worked out. K-State rushing yards, 211 and a half. The Wildcats ended up at 228 for the game and uh, just kind of picking out a couple of the things that, that we each said on this. Um, you pointed out, you started out by saying Drew needed to pick a higher number, which, you know, that's like double points for you for pointing that out um, because you talked about K-State using their superior offensive line. And uh, I made note of how I thought it would happen. Um, now, I was a little bit uh, rambunctious with my guess. I said it wouldn't shock me if both DJ Giddens and Trayshawn Ward ran for 100 yards each on Saturday. And then I also mentioned how I expected Avery Johnson to contribute to the running game. And DJ Giddens hit his 100 yards. Uh, started a little slow, but he started breaking off big runs later on in the first half and to, to start the second. Ward was still very good. 56 yards he was able to pick up uh, at, at one point to, to total. And then Avery Johnson added his... 32 to the mix and that's how k-state got there but they were really good running the football on saturday which was expected again with the size advantage they had up front and also just the fact that they had two really talented running backs and that's not going to change all season and then you throw in the running ability of avery johnson which uh is at a very elite level uh, even moving up from the high school ranks absolutely and the only thing that i would add is if you told me that will howard was also going to throw for 297 yards, I might have been a little hesitant on the two or going over there, but uh, they they probably hit the over on both rushing and passing. Uh, pretty dominant offensive performance, even though they really weren't like super clean or super sharp. Yeah, fifth most yards uh, in a single game in K State history, uh, and the most since a, a 2005 game over North Texas for the Wildcats. They ended up totaling. Uh, 588 was the total number for him in the game. 360 yards passing per case as a team. Avery Johnson had 55 of it, and Trayshawn Ward had eight of it. Uh, real quick, I, I want to mention this with you. Uh, were you surprised at all after the game that Chris Kleiman gave Trayshawn Ward so much credit about his throwing ability? Uh, maybe you know, hinting at that that's not going to be the last time we see Trayshawn Ward throw a pass this season. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, I didn't really recognize that in the time i think i was probably too zeroed in on the content that we had to create i probably should have used that as part of the content that we created but if you look back on it he basically was just like saying man he can really spin it and stuff like that like he, he spoke uh, about him as if he was a quarterback uh probably 
I guess it's loosely tied in, but I'm just like taken aback by how much they are. They have like zero problem, like adorning Avery Johnson as like the next coming uh, of a legend. And and not that they are going over and beyond that, but just compared to their typical behavior and how they address things, uh, usually being pretty conservative in nature, like Chris Kleiman joking, like, I'm surprised you guys waited this long to talk about, to ask me about Avery Johnson. Like they, they have zero like hesitation and so much willingness to really praise him. And so does Will Howard actually as well. That one that tells me that they're really not worried about the dynamics of the quarterback room. And two, it tells me like he's really that good that they know they have no other choice. Yeah, Avery Johnson, the new Deuce Vaughn, and Chris Kleiman basically begging the media to ask him about it. Uh, there were a couple of times last year where it, like, I think, I'm trying to think what game it was. It was a conference game, like late part of the year where Chris Kleiman came in there and he was basically just like, hey, don't, don't forget that number 22. He's a pretty good player, too. Uh, that's kind of the stage we're, we're getting to with Avery Johnson where it's like they want to be asked about him now. So I'm sure that will wear off at some point you know it'll be and k-state's in no business of playing a backup quarterback but chris Kleiman uh, would probably shut it down then but right now they're all about it uh another note and this one was you know we we may have uh not gotten this one quite on the money um it was it was trending in a direction to where he wouldn't get there but austin moore drew set it a little bit high eight and a half tackles we all took the under it worked out he was a machine still in this game um but he obviously was not needed for the entirety of it. And there were a lot of guys in front of him that the defensive line played well enough to where he didn't have to, you know, come up there and, and save their bacon too terribly much. Uh, he ends up finishing the game with six total tackles, but also one sack and, and three tackles for loss in uh, the game. What did you make of Austin Moore's performance? And do we see him this coming week reach that total of eight and a half going above it? Yeah, I would say that the, Pace and the script of the game dictated that under more than anything. Probably why we all did choose the under. So we kind of projected it to unfold in that way. Regardless, he might have been the best player on the field. Like, I'm talking about offense, defense, special teams. Now, Cooper Beebe probably has an argument with that. I mean, that dude switched from the left side to the right side, to the left side, to the right side, guard to tackle, to guard to tackle. Like, that's unheard of in one game. Um, it's hard enough to switch from guard to tackle, do it left and right is, um, adds a whole new element of difficulty as well. So I thought Cooper BB and Austin Moore, they were, those two really, and we'll talk about it, the nose guards as well. But if you're talking about who was the best offensive player on the field, Cooper BB's up there for me. Uh, DJ Giddens is up there for me. Who's the, who was the best defense player on the field? I don't know if there's a close second to Austin Moore. Yeah, it's it's tough to pick out. I mean, I, I think if you picked anybody, you're probably starting to hand out like, well, you, actually, your performance impressed me, so that's why I'm going to throw you into this conversation. Austin Moore was just shoulders above everybody else. He was mixing it in. Maybe the other guy that I would throw up there, but he certainly doesn't beat Austin Moore, would probably be Nate Matlack, the way he played. You know, it's it's big to see – uh, how he'll do with maybe a healthier year for him. I mean, they even mentioned it on the broadcast, so everybody kind of knew it. But like last year, he's just a dude that played in every game, but he was always being ailed by something. And he was able to get into the mix, a couple tackles for loss. He The play that stood out to me was the pass deflection that he had where he basically about picked it off while he was diving. Um, I thought Nate Matlack had a really positive game. And then, you know, we'll, we'll talk about it, but the nose guards as a whole, had a really good game, uh, but nobody can can hold a candle to what Austin Moore uh, was able to do. The first over-under that we uh, had a little bit of difference on, and maybe this was insider trading since Drew was setting these lines, he took the under on SEMO turnovers at one and a half. You and I both went over. Uh, while I think the K-State defense, at least up front, did enough to maybe force a couple of turnovers, they did force a fumble that they recovered that ultimately they ruled uh, the player was down. But K-State wasn't able to force any turnovers against SEMO in the game. And we talked about this a little bit yesterday, myself, Fan, and Drew. And basically, Fan's point was, hey, 
SEMO really didn't put themselves in a position throwing the ball to where they could have turned it over. A lot of check downs. And again, another thing we'll talk about when it comes to the secondary, they just didn't have many opportunities to make plays. Like if you went back and looked at the the total air yards on each pass that Paxton De Laurent had, it, it probably not many of them went over 10. A lot of it was being kept in front of the defenders. So K-State not able to uh, force a turnover. First time under Chris Kleiman, they've not forced a turnover against an FCS opponent. So oh. a little, little surprising there. Uh, what did you make of the defense not forcing the turnover despite getting the shutout? I don't think it was indicative of anything like negative. They, I mean, they played really fast just the way they said they were. Like they might be a faster defense than they were last year. I think that kind of, you know, put itself on the field. Uh, it was kind of noticeable. I, I say we just got bad luck. Like Nate Matlack catches that, that's one. The refs don't overturn it, that's two. Boom. Sorry, Drew, you lose. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Uh, another one that uh, we all hit this one, the over on players with a carry of four and a half. If you go in and look, K-State ended up having seven guys with a carry in the game on Saturday, or at least it were credited with one. Obviously, Giddens and Ward. Avery Johnson had five. Joe Jackson had four. Three for Will Howard, one for Anthony Frias, and one for Jace Brown. So uh, K-State was able to kind of spread the love around with uh, the different rushers in the game and uh, the, the three biggest positives being Giddens, Ward, and Johnson who uh, had productive nights on the ground for K-State. Um, I, I won't ask you what it means that all of those guys got touches, but what did you make of the guys that produced with the touches they had in the game? Yeah, I thought DJ Giddens was spectacular. Um, Treshaw Ward ran hard and Avery Johnson was basically what we thought he would be on the ground and that's a dynamic explosive runner that can really kind of a touchdown waiting to happen or a highlight waiting to happen anyway. Uh, there's a reason why your highlights, I think, of just Avery Johnson's plays. Her, I, I want to say they're north of 10,000 views on YouTube right now. So um, must see TV right now. Yes. I mean, Avery Johnson is going to uh, help fund like every media outlet that covers Kansas State for years to come, I think, um, just by the attraction um, that he is at this point. Also, Drew. We need a better line, man. Four and a half. Come on. Yeah, when they get that many guys uh, touches, yeah, we, we something, something's up there. <laughs> uh, the last one that we had, and this one, I was the only one to get it right. Now, maybe it happened in a, a very different way than what we would have anticipated. Will Howard, total touchdowns, three and a half. You both took the under. I took the over. Uh, um. I would have been a sucker if Drew said passing touchdowns. I still would have taken the over, and you guys would have been right with it, but he said total. And uh, I wasn't surprised that Will Howard got the rushing touchdown. He's got a little bit of that. You know, they both wear 18, and they're big guys, but he's got a little bit of that Peyton Manning in him where he's so much of like an upright, just standard passer now that you can, you know, kind of pull the string on teams and sneak him out and rush him in in short yardage situations because they're going to sell out so hard to the run one direction, which – honestly, is kind of what set up his receiving touchdown. And Chris Kleiman said that afterwards. He said they were over-pursuing so much. The play always works in practice. Like, we knew we had it. And uh, he ends up with two passing touchdowns, a rushing touchdown, and then obviously the crown jewel. And probably the biggest highlight of the game was Treshawn Ward's touchdown pass to Will Howard, who it wasn't like he was wide open and had to take one step into the end zone. He had, a, he had to do some running there and make sure that nobody caught up to him, go down the sideline. Uh, so some some serious credit is deserved of Will Howard for how he handled uh, catching that ball and scoring the touchdown. You just spiked the football for being the only one right when it was because Will Howard caught a touchdown. Hey, you know, uh, I can I guess I can see into the future. I, I don't think that we'll see a Will Howard receiving touchdown the rest of the season, though. That would be uh, my bet. <laughs> I will uh, eat this hat. If he catches another touchdown. Okay. Well, uh, speaking of uh, speaking of that, I uh, we'll we'll get into our our storylines for the week now because this ties in with it directly. Um, I was given some guff on uh, on on the message boards about my comments with Chris Kleiman handling group of five opponents, um, people that he has lost to twice in his first four years at K State, being Arkansas State and Tulane, and. and 
and Navy. And Navy, yeah, good, great point. Uh, I, I, I've only counted the non-com ones. I've, I have, I've shortchanged my, my anger towards Chris Kleiman, I guess. No, uh, to so be, three to, losses. Yeah, but to be fair, we all, I think, erased the memory of that Liberty Bowl. So. Uh, yeah, there a lot of bad from that. The trick play at the end. I lost like twenty dollars on a Papa John's order because I fell asleep in the hotel room that night. I was so tired. I had a bunch of texts from the delivery guy, and I was like, "Man, I'm so tired. I've been working all day." I was like, "You can just keep it. Happy New Year's," and and moved on with it. And there there was bucks down the drain. Um, but the storyline that I'll tie in here is the the group of five curse essentially is what we're calling this and i said that i will run a 40 yard dash on the field after the game if k state loses to troy this weekend and you can put the blame on me and we'll put it on camera so it will be like it you know i keeping myself honest you know trying to to make are sure we running, are we are you doing it hey, for i charity? believe in this I, I don't think it'll happen are you doing it for charity like rich Eisen? yes <laughs> uh, uh yeah, I mean, I don't know that I've got Rich Eisen money or the owls that Rich Eisen gets for that, but uh, I don't know. Maybe I'll give like a $5 bill to one of the kids running around on the field down there after the game <laughs> if if it happens. It, it goes to your daughter's college fund. There you go. <laughs> uh, here's here's some shop credit to the Wichita Public Golf Courses that I still have in my wallet, kid. Knock yourself out. Um, but the, the group of five curses, it, I mean, it feels like a real thing. As much as the uniform curse – saying has kind of broken in over the last few years it's one of those deals where you write it off but last year that two lane game you just go okay something must be in the water even though the two lane game is really easy to explain last year like it was clear adrian martinez was not trusting of his ability to throw the ball downfield yet there was some lack of aggression problems he got that fixed and it wasn't a problem the rest of the year for k-state they were just a limited offense against Tulane, who turned out to be a really good team they they won Cotton Bowl, and they were, you know, a top 10 team to finish the season. But there's no excuses. K-State still probably should have won that game. Uh, wh what do you expect and make of another group of five team coming in to kind of spoil Chris Kleiman's uh, start to the season? I, I tend to not believe in curses in general, so I, I guess I don't buy into it. You just got to show up. Uh, can't take your opponent lightly. You know, attack it like you would any other game, stuff like that. I, I, the Tulane one, you can kind of explain. Navy was year one; they were still working out the yeah. kinks, I think. And Navy's Arkansas a weird State. team to play in in a bowl game. Like that was the yeah. storyline. The instance that we found out that K State was playing them, it was that this you don't want to play the service academies in these bowl games because you're trying to get experience, you're trying to work in things to set you up for next year. But now you have to prepare for something totally different than what you'll ever face. Basically, the rest of the time you're at K-State, even though K-State will play Army, uh, what, next year and a couple years from now in the non-con, so maybe they'll have some things to look back on for that. But that one's explainable, and so is the Arkansas State one. Like, we know just how jacked up the COVID year was. Uh, it, was a, it was a messy experience in a lot of ways for K-State. But still, you have that many losses, the group of five teams on the resume, despite how Chris Kleiman's been, there are going to be some questions. Right, I mean – Sounds like excuses, but you can't explain the way most of them. Navy, first year, working out the kinks, weird team to play in a bowl. Arkansas State, COVID, jacked up, um, everything. I mean, they, they beat Oklahoma the following year, or following week, I believe. And then uh, Tulane, you know, a Avery Johnson, or Avery Johnson, Adrian Martinez, he had to settle in. Tulane might have been pretty good. Like, I just don't see an excuse uh, or a live one for Troy, so it better not happen. <laughs> that's that's basically. And I will say this, and and maybe I'll eat my words, eat my hat, whatever happens here. But I also think Troy's not that good. Um, I thought they did last year with the twelve and two season, a lot of smoke and mirrors. It's easily a season. It could have been just seven or eight wins. You know, good for them. I just I think they take a pretty steep step back and. I think their week one shaky win over Stephen F. Austin is probably an example of that. Yeah, I mean, 48 to 30, they gave up a lot of points to Stephen F. Austin. They scored a lot themselves. And I That's said this weird, yesterday. Too. Yeah, I, and I said I said this yesterday on, on our, our Sunday recap show, and it was basically just I will if if what is what is good at for Troy is their offense, I will take that offense against K State's questionable defense right now. 
and put up K-State's offense against Troy's obviously not very good defense. And I, I'm with you. It seems like Troy is heading towards a, a regression point this year, uh, and we'll, we'll see what happens. Like, they were really good against, you know, some group of five teams last year, but they also had a lot of close wins last season that you go and look at and say, and those weren't really impressive teams that you beat there. So I am with you on that. They should beat Troy. Uh, they will at least get tested a little bit more, I think, than what SEMO did. And uh, probably in some areas that are more important, like the secondary, they've got a more experienced quarterback, probably a guy that's going to be a little bit more willing to, to push it in some categories. So um, you're probably going to get exactly what you want out of Troy in this game. And fingers crossed, I'm not trying to jinx K-State, but they will not lose to this group of five school. I just, I will say that right now. If they do, you're running a 40 and it's going to be videotaped and somebody's getting a golf membership or something. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, I'm growing, uh, I'm growing the game, giving it out to a, a small child. There you go. Hey, it's, that's, uh, that's generous on your part. I look, the weird thing about Troy in that first game, and obviously we'll dig more into all this when we do our preview, uh, episode, uh, later in the week when we probably dig into Troy a little bit more is that last year, they were a suspect offense with an elite defense. So I don't I don't know what happened in week one, but it was basically a 180 from last year. Yeah, it's weird. They they did at the end of last season put up serious points against Arkansas State and Coastal Carolina, but then that's really the only time all season that they scored above 35 points, except when they played an FCS opponent last year. So you're right, weird team, very strange what happened. And uh, th this seems like the type of thing K-State will be prepared for. And on top of that, now that there are three losses to group of five schools under Chris Kleiman, it's similar to how I, I think he has these teams very much prepared to play these FCS opponents and explains, hey, they're no slouch, like take this seriously. I think now there is plenty of ammunition that will be used to just say, hey, I'm going to be straight up with you guys. We're going to cut the crap. Like we are not losing to another opponent like this because we've done it too many times and we're better than that. And they'll probably go from there. Uh, moving, I like, that. I like that. I'll add one more thing, just because I thought of it, and it has nothing to do with anything that we've discussed. So <laughs> this is this is not related one iota. But you talked about um, ammunition and kind of putting the, you know, the gavel down. This is what's going to happen. That's what Missouri is going to do against for the Kansas State game this year in Week Three. I think yes. we all know that. So uh, if you like gambling, uh, Middle Tennessee is plus twenty and a half against Mizzou this week. And case they're taking a peek ahead to K State next. Oh, week. okay, I like that. Well, that that might be uh, everybody keep that in the back of your head for best bets later in the week uh, during during the preview pod. Uh, moving on, an, obviously another big storyline in this process is the injury situation right now for K State. A couple of the injury things got cleared up on Saturday. We saw Daniel Green out there. We saw Uso Samalo out there. Uh, obviously have not seen Christian Duffy yet, and, and who knows that – I doubt we see him this week against Troy. I, there's just not much of a point to it. The, the hope would be that he's back for the Missouri game and they could use him for that. But now there have been some other guys added to that fold, and Jake Clifton is a very big one that's been added to the injury mix. So what are you keeping your eye on with the K-State injury situation and how it impacts what they do against Troy this week and what it's looking like moving forward for them? Yeah, the good thing is – Daniel Green and Uso Sayamala both played and appeared to have zero setbacks. So you got them uh, on the mend and on track to be 100% uh, either by this week's Troy game or, or maybe the following week against Missouri. So I, I think they're exactly where in the timeline where you'd like them to be. Unfortunately, Jay Clifton left the game in the second quarter. I want to say went to the locker room, uh, didn't return to the game, not on the depth chart this week. So that's probably pretty telling. The same thing with Christian Duffy, not on the depth chart again. I think that's probably a pretty good insight into what their availability and status is this week. Uh, hopefully Duffy's back from Mizzou. I think it'll be, it might be a few weeks uh, when it comes to Jay Clifton this time around. So I, I think you'll, you'll probably be without the linebacker uh, for a bit. Uh, maybe the bye week, maybe, maybe that's the target date. I, I would say Keegan Johnson's another Big one. Yeah. Um, was not in uniform, didn't play against SEMO. I, I think the hope is that he's going to play against Troy. The hope that it was precautionary. That's what you, you kind of hear. It's kind of what Chris Kleiman alluded to in his post game press conference. 
even though he's listed as an or, but Jaden Jackson, he is on the depth chart. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. It'll be interesting how they play that. It would seem like, obviously, they didn't play it like there was a ton of concern about the Keegan Johnson thing. And I would assume that before they go to Missouri, where he certainly seems like he's on track to play in that game, they would like to get him out there a little bit, see what he's like, and uh, go from there. Very similar to, like, I, I would point out, you know, on the Uso Sayamalo side, K-State got exactly what you would have wanted out of him in the SEMO game. I think he only played like 11 snaps, but he was really good in those 11, made an impact, made plays. You got him out. He continues his recovery, and he keeps tracking to being 100% for the game against Missouri. So really positive there. Totally agree. I think uh, before they play Missouri, especially since he hasn't played in a game for Kansas State yet, which was kind of at least starting wise was the case for Russo, I think you'd like to get Keegan's feet wet before that Mizzou game. We'll see uh, if they're that accomplished. Uh, the defense was really good for K-State on Saturday. Obviously, we mentioned, hey, no turnovers, but no points allowed. Mo to just six rushing yards in the game, uh, including the Ohio Valley Athlete of the Year last season. This was supposed to be the, the, the top thing that Simo had offensively. Geno Hester running back. 10 carries, negative four yards. Uh, his longest run of the day went for one yard. That says a lot about what K-State was able to do up front. Uh, and obviously then the back half of the defense really wasn't tested as much as maybe we would have liked to have seen to get a little bit more clarity on them. Uh, but we're going to be watching to see if the defense can repeat that performance this week in any similar fashion. And inside of that, I'm thinking the corners still have a lot to prove because we didn't really get to see anything out of them this weekend. Yeah, that's the big thing, and I know you kind of discussed that off air a little bit, so you can dig into that a l- even deeper if you wish. But th- the big thing this week is not so much if you can repeat a shutout, but re- repeat really solid play across the board as a defense because what I would anticipate is that Troy is a little bit more willing to stretch the field and, and test you more vertically, and-, and maybe you have more things to worry about if that's the case. So, uh and you hope, to be honest, if you're the coaching staff of Kansas State, if you're a fan of Kansas State, you'd hope Troy does that. Because if not, man, you're walking into Missouri with pretty much unchallenged. And yeah, they have a quarterback issue perhaps as well. I don't know if anyone's really scared of what Brady Cook can do. But did I say Brady Cook? Is that it, Brady Cook? Yeah, yeah. Brady Cook. Yep. I don't know if anyone's really scared of what Brady Cook can do. But I think you want to you know, at least have some reps in games where you felt like you really had to compete down the field because, like you said, they didn't have to against Mm -hmm. Seymour. Well, and, you know, Brady Cook maybe doesn't scare you for Missouri, but certainly the guys that he's throwing to can can give you concern. So uh, I'm with you on that. And, yeah, the the corners thing, like, uh, they weren't bad over the weekend. Like, I I mentioned this in player grades uh, or position grades earlier today. Basically, if you look at it, like, there would have been a scenario where a team could have gone out there and taken advantage of K-State if the corners were that bad. Like, SEMO could have done that and and found a few more holes, gotten a few more things done offensively. They didn't, so K-State's corners were good to do that. But for the most part, we really only saw them in tackling situations and how we could kind of observe what they did, which I thought Jacob Parrish and Keenan Garber did a good job of um, from, from what I was able to observe. But – Troy should test them a little bit more just because Gunnar Watson is a more experienced quarterback, has played a high. So similar to what you just said, like he will probably be more willing to take some chances to kind of push it a little bit harder. And we just need to see what these corners are really like, what they're they're going to be um, and, and see if they get tested because SEMO was really conservative on a lot of that stuff. I already said it earlier, but like not a ton of throws that that jump out at you that I think were like over 10 yards in the air. Everything was kind of kept in front of the back half of K-State's defense. And that's why if you go and look at, you know, the who made the tackles for K-State over the weekend, um, a lot of them ended up coming from, you know, we, we saw good performances from linebackers in the game. or we off obviously up front, like a lot of defensive linemen got involved in the tackling. Department. So uh, I think that's something that I'm fascinated in watching. And, and we'll see if the corners are able to uh, get tested a little bit more and answer the call. I tend to think that Troy is probably a good opponent to do it against just because they're not going to be world beaters in that category, but they will push you a little bit more uh, than what SEMO did. Uh, Looking at the other side 
side of it, you know, we, we've talked about some of the things that we're, we're looking forward to this week. What questions do you still have about this K-State team or new ones that popped up? Or maybe we have some uh, questions that got answered after the win over SEMO because certainly the one that sticks out to me that got answered in some way, maybe, you know, different, better opponents will come down the line. But the nose guards looked really, really good for uh, what we were able to see. For, for sure, the top three guys, Damian Elalio made an immediate impact for K-State, got involved in a sack. Javanch looked quick and fat there. And then Uso, his 11 snaps, he made the most of them and uh, kind of showcased exactly what Chris Kleiman and his staff had talked about this offseason. Uh, where were where are the questions that you have uh, that were either answered or that are still out there for this coming week? Yeah, for the most part, I think we got that answer about the nose guards. At least it wasn't going to be a huge weakness that you had to worry about. Uh, they weren't underwhelming. There was there were points of the Kansas State team that were underwhelming, and that wasn't one of them. So, you know, I want to see a larger sample size, but I got everything I wanted to see in that game. Uh, like you said, probably need to see the cornerbacks tested a little bit more, the secondary just in general. Um, want to see a little bit more uh, from Chris Tennant. I, I loved what I got out of the gate but I'm not really worried about the deep one. So I'm worried about the medium, medium ones, the short ones. So uh, I love that for his confidence. Let's, let's just, uh, yeah, I want to see, you know, give me, you know, four or five attempts between 30 and 45 yards. And let's see where he's at at that point. And that's nothing against him. Great starting point, but got to see a little bit more. Uh, but a 51 yard field goal. I mean, he can drill those. Let's see what he can do with the change-ups, uh, with a little bit more of the lobs, the layups, so to speak. Offensively, I think I got my an- my question answered on R.J. Garcia. Um, he's ready. Uh, what Now, we'll see what happens when he gets schemed up a little bit, right, and, and teams, but he's at least from an understanding standpoint and not afraid of the moment, go get yours, he's ready. So I, I think that's – really what comes to mind. Um, I think, I guess we can't say with 100% certainty, but I think we probably got our question answered to who's the backup quarterback because yes. they really they really wanted reps from Avery Johnson. Uh, you want those for a reason. You don't really want him to get all those reps extended action because you're just going to sit him the rest of the year. You want him to get that action because you anticipate play, playing him some more. We talked about this yesterday, and my point on it was this. Um, Chris Kleiman was very transparent about it. What he said made sense. Hey, we just, you know, we wanted to give Avery Johnson th- this m- many snaps, this many series, get a flow, get a serious feel for the game. And my point on it was makes total sense, but that's also, I think, kind of a double sided statement by him because you know what Jake Rubley doesn't have a lot of in his career at K State? situations like that where he's been able to be out on the field for an extended time even in garbage time you know uh, probably the most continuous snaps that we've seen Jake Rubley take were from the failed quarterback sneak to his interception in the TCU game last season Um, so he lacks that experience and so I I just think it was probably a a very telling comment by Chris Kleiman um, for multiple reasons And, and I think it shows that Avery Johnson probably is the backup on this team right now combined with the fact that they have been very open that, hey, this dude has been really awesome and has developed really well and really fast for being a true freshman. Yeah, I think I think Rubley got a drive or two uh, against the FCS opponent last year, if I remember correctly. Because we were yeah, like, he may have, but it's, it's straightness. Yeah. Who was who they played? Was it South Dakota? South Dakota last year, yeah. Yeah, I think he did. Yeah, I think he saw a drive or two there. Well, because th- – Will the Will Howard didn't even get in against South Dakota last year, They're did he? Protecting his red shirt, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was gonna say we there they that we didn't see him last year, so I think that's just one of those things. One other question that kind of popped up, and again, probably not overly concerned, but the expectations are so high for these guys that there was a moment in there where you go, okay, I'd like to see you pick it up a little bit more. The offensive line showed a little bit of a lull there at one point. A lot of that came in like the running game where I I wrote about it today, but K-State went from like the 13-minute mark of the first quarter to basically the two-minute mark of the second quarter without over 10 yards. I think they only had one of them from Treshawn Ward. Um, I think that the offensive line, there are still questions there on sorting out 
uh, for sure when Christian Duffy is not in the lineup, but also just in general, uh, how stable the guys that have starting jobs right now will be able to keep them and if they're going to be able to uh, kind of hold up and, and live up to the hype that's been set in front of them this season. Would agree. It kind of – and this is going to sound rough, and it's not supposed to be rough because it was game one, too, and then this is a guy that hasn't played a bunch. But it seemed like they were trying to figure out what was going to happen to right tackle still without Christian Duffy, mm-hmm. I thought. Yeah, no, that uh, that would that would seem to to make sense, and it was that the right side that gave up the pressure that led to Will Howard's interception. Now, I also may know this that interception on Will Howard. I mean, it was it was going to be a tight ball anyways, and a very iffy one to begin with. But then he wasn't able to get any power or juice on it because he had a guy popping him right in the chest immediately. So, um, just one of those things to watch out for. Um, and certainly they could come out and have a dominant performance against Troy, and it, it won't be much of a big deal at all what happened against SEMO. So we'll, uh, we'll see what happens there. Uh, any other takeaways or things that, that you're trying to prepare for ahead of the Troy uh, game before we get out of here? No, we're probably going to have our eyes on just if Keegan Johnson is going to be able to play in game two because I, I think uh, they'd, they'd like to get him out there as uh, quickly as possible. And, I, you know, kind of said this, I just – I would be a little concerned isn't the right word, but like uneasy if Missouri is the first game for him. Yep. I'm, I'm with you. You know, now that you bring that up about trying to work him in and, and how that might work out, it's just, it would be much easier to not have your first game with a brand new team uh, come against a power five opponent, no matter what people think of Missouri. I think they're a better team than what they were last year. Um, and honestly, they played better the rest of the way after K-State kind of dismantled them um, throughout the, the season. It would just be nice if you, you get a little bit of a, a grace period. And again, it's similar to what Uso had this weekend against SEMO. He got his 11 snaps, looked good, got him out of there. Keegan Johnson, same type of deal. He doesn't need to play, you know, first or second most snaps of any receiver this weekend for me to maybe feel better about him. But get him in there a couple times, see how the connection works out between him and Will Howard, get him out of there and uh, – be prepared for a, a full workload against Missouri in week three. Uh, that will do it for Derek Young and myself, Mason Voth, here on the KSO Show. We will be back with plenty of more YouTube comment on Tuesday because Chris Kleiman will have his press conference. Players will speak to the media after week one as they prepare for Troy. And then uh, D.Y. and I will be back on Wednesday with an edition of the KSO Show, kind of going over what Chris Kleiman said, breaking down everything that uh, we expect to come out of his words and what they kind of meant. And then obviously later on in the week, we will be back again with another edition of the KSO show, setting the stage for the weekend's game with Troy, 11 a.m. kickoff this week. And uh, we'll look forward to that as well as everything else going on around K-State football here on K-State Online. Make sure that if you're only consuming content on YouTube right now, you make sure you go over to On3, get signed up there, and check everything out to uh, get the best access that you can get and information and coverage on the Wildcats all season long. So we will be back. More content on the YouTube on Tuesday and plenty of content all throughout the week over at On3 with K-State Online.